Section seven of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Beatty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter six B, Part one A, The World of Spirit in Self Estrangement, Part one the sphere of spirit at this stage breaks up into two regions the one is its real world its self-estrangement the other is constructed and set up in the ether of pure consciousness and is exalted above the first the second world being constructed in opposition and contrast to that estrangement is just on that account not free from it on the contrary it is only another form of that very estrangement which consists precisely in having a conscious existence in two sorts of worlds and embraces both hence it is not self-consciousness of absolute being in and for itself not religion which is here dealt with it is belief faith in so far as faith is a flight from the actual world and thus is not a self-complete experience an und für sich. such flight from the realm of the present is therefore directly in its very nature a dual state of mind pure consciousness is the sphere into which spirit rises but it is not only the element of faith but of the notion as well consequently both appear on the scene together at the same time and the latter comes before us only in antithesis to the former culture and its sphere of objective reality the spirit of this world is spiritual essence permeated by a self-consciousness which knows itself to be directly present as a self-existent particular and has that essence as its objective actuality over against itself but the existence of this world as also the actuality of self-consciousness depends on the process that self-consciousness divests itself of its personality by so doing creates its world and treats it as something alien and external of which it must now take possession but the renunciation of its self-existence is itself the production of objective actuality and in doing so therefore self-consciousness ipso facto makes itself master of this world to put the matter otherwise self-consciousness is only something definite it only has real existence so far as it alienates itself from itself by doing so it puts itself in the position of something universal and this its universality actualizes it establish it it objectively makes it valid this equality of the self with all selves is therefore not the equality that was found in the case of right self-consciousness does not here as there get immediate recognition and acknowledgment merely because it is on the contrary its claim to be rests on its having made itself by that mediating process of self-alienation conform to what is universal the spiritless formal universality which characterizes the sphere of right takes up every natural form of character as well as of existence and sanctions and establishes them the universality which holds good here is one that has undergone development and for that reason it is concrete and actual the means then whereby an individual gets objective validity and concrete actuality here is the formative process of culture the alienation on the part of spirit from its natural existence is here the individual's true and original nature his very substance the relinquishment of this natural state is therefore both his purpose and his mode of existence it is at the same time the mediating process the transition of the thought constituted substance to concrete actuality as well as conversely the transition of determinate individuality to its essential constitution this individuality moulds itself by culture to what it inherently is and only by so doing is it then something per se and possessed of concrete existence the extent of its culture is the measure of its reality and its power although the self qua this particular self knows itself here to be real yet its concrete realization consists solely in cancelling and transcending the natural self the original determinateness of its nature is therefore reduced to a matter of quantity to a greater or less energy of will a non-essential principle of distinction but purpose and content of the self belong to the universal substance alone and can only be something universal 
the specific particularity of a given nature which becomes purpose and content is something powerless and unreal it is a kind of being which exerts itself foolishly and in vain to attain embodiment it is the contradiction of giving reality to the bare particular while reality is ipso facto something universal if therefore individuality is falsely held to consist in particularity of nature and character then the real world contains no individualities and characters individuals are all alike for one another the pretence vermeint of individuality in that case is precisely the mere presumptive gemeint existence which has no permanent place in this world where only renunciation of self and therefore only universality get actual reality what is presumed or conjectured to be das gemeinte passes therefore simply for what it is for a kind of being kind is not quite the same as espèce the most horrible of all nicknames for it signifies mediocrity and denotes the highest degree of contempt a kind and to be good of its kind are german expressions which add an air of honesty to this meaning as if it were not so badly meant and intended after all or which indeed do not yet involve a clear consciousness of what kind and what culture and reality are that which in reference to the particular individual appears as his culture is the essential moment of spiritual substance as such that is the direct transition of its ideal thought constituted universality into actual reality or otherwise put culture is the single soul of this substance in virtue of which the essentially inherent an sich becomes something explicitly acknowledged and assumes definite objective existence the process in which an individuality cultivates itself is therefore ipso facto the development of individuality qua universal objective being that is to say it is the development of the actual world this world although it has come into being by means of individuality is in the eyes of self-consciousness something that is directly alienated and estranged and for self-consciousness takes on the form of a fixed undisturbed reality but at the same time self-consciousness is sure this is its own substance and proceeds to take it under control this power over its substance it acquires by culture which looked at from this aspect appears as self-consciousness making itself conform to reality and doing so to the extent permitted by the energy of its original character and talents what seems here to be the individual's power and force bringing the substance under it and thereby doing away with that substance is the same thing as the actualization of the substance for the power of the individual consists in conforming itself to that substance that is in emptying itself of its own self and thus establishing itself as the objectively existing substance its culture and its own reality are therefore the process of making the substance itself actual and concrete the self is conscious of being actual only as transcended or cancelled the self does not here constitute the unity of consciousness of self and object rather this object is negative as regards the self by means of the self qua inner soul of the process the substance is so moulded and worked up in its various moments that one opposite puts life into the other each opposite by its alienation from the other gives the other stability and similarly gets stability from the other at the same time each moment has its own definite nature in the sense of having an insuperable worth and significance and has a fixed reality as against the other the process of thought fixes this distinction in the most general manner possible by means of the absolute opposition of good and bad which are poles asunder and can in no way become one and the same but the very soul of what is thus fixed consists in its immediate transition to its opposite its existence lies really in transmuting each determinate element into its opposite and it is only this alienation that constitutes the essential nature and the preservation of the whole we must now consider this process by which the moments are thus made actual and give each other life the alienation will be found to alienate itself and the whole thereby will take all its contents back into the ultimate principle it implies seinen begriff at the outset we must deal with the substance pure and simple in its immediate aspect as an organization of its moments they exist there but are inactive their soul is wanting 
we have here something like what we find in nature nature we find is resolved and spread out into separate and separable elements air water fire earth of these air is the unchanging factor purely universal and transparent water the reality that is forever being dissolved and given up fire its pervading active unity which is ever dissolving opposition into unity as well as breaking up simple unity into opposite constituents earth is the tightly compact knot of these separated factors the subject in which these realities are where their processes take effect that which they start from and to which they return in the same way the inner essential nature the simple life of spirit that pervades self-conscious reality is resolved spread out into similar general areas or masses spiritual masses in this case and appears as a whole organized world in the first area or mass it is the inherently universal spiritual being self-identical in the second it is self-existent being it has become inherently self-discordant sacrificing itself abandoning itself the third which takes the form of self-consciousness is subject and possesses in its very nature the fiery force of dissolution in the first case it is conscious of itself as immanent and implicit as existing per se in the second it finds independence self-existence fürsichsein developed and carried out by means of the sacrifice of what is universal but spirit itself is the self-containedness and self-completeness of the whole which splits up into substance qua constantly enduring and substance engaged in self-sacrifice and which at the same time resumes substance again into its own unity a whole which is at once a flame of fire bursting out and consuming the substance as well as the abiding form of the substance consumed we can see that the areas of spiritual reality here referred to correspond to the community and the family in the ethical world without however possessing the native familiarity of spirit which the latter have on the other hand if destiny is alien to this spirit self-consciousness is and knows itself here to be the real power underlying them we have now to consider these separate members of the whole in the first instance as regards the way they are presented qua thoughts qua essential inherent entities falling within pure consciousness and also secondly as regards the way they appear as objective realities in concrete conscious life in the first form the simplicity of content found in pure consciousness the real is the good the self-identical immediate unchanging and primal nature of every consciousness the independent spiritual power inherent in its essence alongside which the activity of the mere self-existent consciousness is only by-play its other is the passive spiritual being the universal so far as it parts with its own claims and lets individuals get in it the consciousness of their particular existence it is a state of nothingness a being that is null and void the bad this absolute break-up of the real into these disjecta membra is itself a permanent condition while the first member is the foundation starting-point and result of individuals which are there purely universal the second member on the other hand is a being partly sacrificing itself for another and on that very account is partly their incessant return to self qua individual and their constant development of a separate being of their own but secondly these bare ideas of good and bad are similarly and immediately alienated from one another they are actual and in actual consciousness appear as moments that are objective in this sense the first state of being is the power of the state the second its resources or wealth the state power is the simple spiritual substance as well as the achievement of all the absolutely accomplished fact wherein individuals find their essential nature expressed and where their particular existence is simply and solely a consciousness of their own universality it is likewise the achievement and simple result from which the sense of its having been their doing has vanished it stands as the absolute basis of all their action where all their action securely subsists this simple pervading substance of their life owing to its thus determining their unalterable self-identity has the nature of objective being and hence only stands in relation to and exists for another it is thus ipso facto inherently the opposite of itself wealth or resources 
although wealth is something passive is nothingness it is likewise a universal spiritual entity the continuously created result of the labour and action of all just as it is again dissipated into the enjoyment of all in enjoyment each individuality no doubt becomes aware of self-existence aware of itself as particular but this enjoyment is itself the result of universal action just as reciprocally wealth calls forth universal labour and produces enjoyment for all the actual has through and through the spiritual significance of being directly universal each individual doubtless thinks he is acting in his own interests when getting this enjoyment for this is the aspect in which he gets the sense of being something on his own account and for that reason he does not take it to be something spiritual yet looked at even in external fashion it becomes manifest that in his own enjoyment each gives enjoyment to all in his own labour each works for all as well as for himself and all for him his self-existence is therefore inherently universal and self-interest is merely a supposition that cannot get the length of making concrete and actual what it means or supposes that is to do something that is not to further the good of all thus then in these two spiritual potencies self-consciousness finds its own substance content and purpose it has there a direct intuitive consciousness of its twofold nature in one it sees what it is inherently in itself in the other what it is explicitly for itself at the same time qua spirit it is the negative unity uniting the subsistence of these potencies with the separation of individuality from the universal or that of reality from the self dominion and wealth are therefore before the individual as objects he is aware of that is as objects from which he knows himself to be detached and between which he thinks he can choose or even decline to choose altogether in the form of this detached bare consciousness he stands over against the essential reality as one which is merely there for him he then has the reality qua essential reality within itself in this bare consciousness the moments of the substance are taken to be not state power and wealth but thoughts the thoughts of good and bad but further self-consciousness is a relation of his pure consciousness to his actual consciousness of what is thought to the objective being it is essentially judgment what is good and what is bad has already been brought out in the case of the two aspects of actual reality by determining what the aspects primarily are the one is state power the other wealth but this first judgment this first distinction of content cannot be looked at as a spiritual judgment for in that first judgment the one side has been characterized as only the inherently existing or positive and the other side as only the explicit self-existent and negative but qua spiritual realities each permeates both moments pervades both aspects and thus their nature is not exhausted in those specific characteristics positive and negative the self-consciousness that has to do with them is self-complete is in itself and for itself it must therefore relate itself to each in that twofold form in which they appear and by so doing this nature of theirs which consists in being self-estranged determinations will come to light now self-consciousness takes that object to be good and to exist per se in which it finds itself and that to be bad when it finds the opposite of itself there goodness means its identity with objective reality badness their disparity at the same time what is for it good and bad is per se good and bad because it is just that in which these two aspects of being per se and of being for it are the same it is the real indwelling soul of the objective facts and the judgment is the evidence of its power within them a power which makes them into what they are in themselves what they are when spirit is actively related to them their identity or non-identity with spirit that is their real nature and the test of their true meaning and not how they are identical or diverse taken immediately in themselves apart from spirit that is not their inherent being and self-existence in abstracto the active relation of spirit to these moments which are first put forward as objects to it and thereafter pass by its action into what is essential and inherent becomes at the same time their reflection into themselves in virtue of which they obtain actual spiritual existence and their spiritual meaning comes to light 
but as their first immediate characteristic is distinct from the relation of spirit to them the third determinate moment their own proper spirit is also distinguished from the second moment their second inherent nature das zweite ansicht derselben their essentiality which comes to light through the relation of spirit to them must in the first instance turn out different from the immediate inherent nature for indeed this mediating process of spiritual activity puts in motion the immediate characteristic and turns it into something else as a result of this process the self-contained conscious mind doubtless finds now in the power of the state its reality pure and simple and its subsistence but it does not find its individuality as such it finds its inherent and essential being but not what it is for itself rather it finds there its action qua individual action rejected and denied and subdued into obedience the individual thus recoils before this power and turns back into himself it is the reality that suppresses him and is the band for instead of being identical with him that with which he is at one it is something utterly in discordance with individuality in contrast with this wealth and riches are the good they tend to the general enjoyment they are there simply to be disposed of and they ensure for every one the consciousness of his particular self riches means in its very nature universal beneficence if it refuses any benefit in a given case and does not gratify every need this is merely an accident which does not detract from its universal and necessary nature of imparting to every individual his share and being a thousand-handed benefactor these two judgments provide the idea of goodness and badness with the content which is the reverse of what they had for us self-consciousness has up till now however been related to its objects only incompletely that is only according to the criterion of the self-existent but consciousness is also real in its inherent nature and has likewise to take this aspect for its point of view and criterion and by so doing ground off completely the judgment of self-conscious spirit according to this aspect state power expresses its essential nature the power of the state is in part the quiet insistence of law in part government and prescription which appoints and regulates the particular processes of universal action the one is the substance pure and simple the other its action which animates and sustains itself and all individuals the individual thus finds therein his ground and nature expressed organized and exercised as against this the individual by the enjoyment of riches does not get to know his own universal nature he only gets a transitory consciousness and enjoyment of himself qua particular and self-existing and discovers his discordance his want of harmony with his own essential nature the conceptions good and bad thus receive here a content the opposite of which they had before these two ways of judging find each of them an identity and a disagreement in the first case consciousness finds the power of the state out of agreement with it and the enjoyment that came from wealth in accord with it while in the second case the reverse holds good there is a twofold attainment of identity and a twofold form of disagreement there is an opposite relation established towards both the essential realities we must pass judgment on these different ways of judging as such to this end we have to apply the criterion already brought forward the conscious relation where identity or agreement is found is according to this standard the good that where want of agreement obtains the bad these two types of relations must henceforth be regarded as modes or forms of conscious existence conscious life through taking up a different kind of relation thereby becomes itself characterized as different comes to be itself good or bad it is not simply distinct in virtue of the fact that it took as its constitutive principle either existence for itself or mere being in itself for both are equally essential moments of its life that dual way of judging above discussed presented those principles as separated and contained therefore merely abstract ways of judging concrete actual conscious life has within it both principles and the distinction between them falls solely within its own nature that is inside the relation of itself to the real this relation takes opposite forms in the one there is an active attitude towards state power and wealth as to something with which it is in accord 
in the other it is related to these realities as to something with which it is at variance a conscious life which finds itself at one with them has the attribute of nobility in the case of the public authority of the state it beholds what is in accord with itself and sees that it has there its own nature pure and simple and a region for the exercise of its own powers and takes up the position of open willing and obedient service in its interests as well as that of inner reverence towards it in the same way in the sphere of wealth it sees that wealth secures for it the consciousness of self-existence of realizing the other essential aspect of its nature hence it looks upon wealth likewise as something essential in relation to itself acknowledges him from whence the enjoyment comes as a benefactor and considers itself under a debt of obligation the conscious life involved in the other relation again that of disagreement has the attribute of baseness it remains at variant with both those essential elements it looks upon the authoritative power of the state as a chain as something suppressing its separate existence for its own sake and hence hates the ruler obeys only with secret malice and stands ever ready to burst out in rebellion it sees too in wealth by which it attains to the enjoyment of its own independent existence merely something discordant or out of harmony with its permanent nature since through wealth it only gets a sense of its particular isolated existence and a consciousness of passing enjoyment this type of mind loves wealth but despises it and with the disappearance of enjoyment of what is inherently evanescent regards its relation to the man of wealth as having ceased too these relations now express in the first instance a judgment the determinate characterization of what both those facts state power and wealth are as objects for consciousness not as yet what they are in their complete objective nature an und für sich the reflection which is presented in this judgment is partly at first for us who are philosophizing an affirmation of the one characteristic along with the other and hence is a simultaneous cancelling of both it is not yet the reflection of them for consciousness itself partly again they are at first immediate essential entities they have not become this nor is there in them consciousness of self that for which they are is not yet their animating principle they are predicates which are not yet themselves subject on account of the separation the entirety of the spiritual process of judgment also breaks asunder into two existent modes of consciousness each of which has a one-sided character now just as at the outset the indifference of the two aspects in the process of self-estrangement one of which was the inherent essential being of pure consciousness that is the determinate ideas of good and bad the other their actual existence in the form of state power and wealth passed to the stage of being related the one to the other passed to the level of judgment in the same way this external relation must be raised to the level of their inner unity must become a relation of thought to actual reality in this way the spirit animating both the forms of judgment will make its appearance this takes place when judgment passes into inference becomes the mediating process in which the middle term necessitating and connecting both sides of the judgment is brought forward the noble type of consciousness then finds itself in judgment related to state power in the sense that this power is indeed not a self as yet but at first is universal substance in which however this form of mind feels its own essential nature to exist is conscious of its own purpose and absolute content by taking up a positive relation to this substance it assumes a negative attitude towards its own special purposes its particular content and individual existence and lets them disappear this type of mind is the heroism of service the virtue which sacrifices individual being to the universal and thereby brings this into existence the type of personality which renounces possession and enjoyment acts for the sake of the prevailing power and becomes a concrete reality in this way through this process the universal becomes united and bound up with existence in general just as the individual consciousness makes itself by this renunciation essentially universal that from which this consciousness alienates itself by submitting to serve is its consciousness immersed in mere existence but the being alienated from itself is the inherent nature by thus shaping its life in accord with what is universal 
it acquires a reverence for itself and gets reverence from others the power of the state however which to start with was merely universal in thought the inherent nature becomes through this very process universal in fact becomes actual power it is actually so only in getting that actual obedience which it obtains through self-consciousness judging it to be the essential reality and through the self being freely surrendered to it the result of this action binding the essential reality and self indissolubly together is to produce a twofold actuality a self that is truly actualized and a state power whose authority is accepted as true owing to this alienation implied in the idea of sacrifice state power however is not yet a self-consciousness that knows itself as state power it is merely the law of the state its inherent principle that is accepted the state power has as yet no particular will for as yet the self-consciousness rendering service has not alienated its pure selfhood and made it an animating influence in the exercise of state power the serving attitude merely gives the state its bare being sacrifices merely its existence to the state not its essential nature this type of self-consciousness passes thus for something that is in conformity with the essential nature and is acknowledged and accepted because of its inherent reality the others find their essential nature operative in it but not their independent existence find their thinking their pure consciousness fulfilled but not their specific individuality it has a value therefore in their thoughts and is honoured accordingly such a type is the haughty vassal he is active in the interests of the state power so far as the latter is not a personal will a monarch but merely an essential will his self-importance lies only in the honour thus acquired only in the general opinion thinking of his concern for the essential will not in an individuality gratefully thinking of his services for he has not helped this individuality the monarch to get independence the language he would use were he to occupy a direct relation to the personal will of the state power which thus far has not arisen would take the form of counsel imparted in the interests of what is the best for all state power has therefore still at this stage no will to meet the advice and does not decide between the different opinions as to what is universally the best it is not yet governmental control and on that account is in truth not yet real state power individual self-existence the possession of an individual will that is not yet qua will surrendered is the inner separatist spiritual principle of the various classes and stations a spirit which keeps for its own behoof what suits itself best in spite of its words about the universal best and this claptrap about what is universally the best tends to be made a substitute for action bringing it about the sacrifice of existence which takes place in the case of service is indeed complete when it goes so far as death but the constant danger of a death which the individual survives leaves a specific kind of existence and hence a particular self-reference still untouched and this makes the counsel imparted in the interests of the universally best ambiguous and open to suspicion it really means in point of fact pertaining the claim to a private opinion of his own and the separate individual will as against the power of the state its relation to the latter is therefore still one of discordance and it possesses the characteristic found in the case of the base type of consciousness it is ever at the point of breaking out into rebellion this contradiction which has to be got rid of in this form of discordance and opposition between the independence of the individual conscious life and the universality belonging to state authority contains at the same time another aspect that renunciation of existence when it is complete as it is in death is one that does not revert to the conscious life that makes the sacrifice it simply is this conscious life does not survive the renunciation and exist by itself as an objective fact an und für sich. it merely passes away in the unreconciled opposition that alone is true sacrifice of individuality therefore in which it gives itself up as completely as in the case of death but all the while preserves itself in the renunciation it comes thereby to be actually what it is implicitly the identical unity of self with its opposed self in this way by the inner withdrawn and separatist spiritual principle 
the self as such coming forward and abrogating itself the state power becomes ipso facto raised into a proper self of its own without this alienation of self the deeds of honour the actions of the noble type of consciousness and the counsels which its insight reveals would continue to maintain the ambiguous character which as we saw kept that secret reserve of private intention and self-will in spite of its overt pretensions end of section seven Section 8 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6b, Part 1a. The World of Spirit and Self-Estrangement, Culture and its Sphere of Objective Reality, Part 2. This estrangement, however, takes place in language, in words alone, and language assumes here its peculiar role. Both in the sphere of the general social order, Siedlichkeit, where language conveys law and commands, and in the sphere of actual life, where it appears as conveying advice, the content of what it expresses is the essential reality, and language is the form of that essential content here however it takes the form in which qua language it exists to be its content and possesses authority qua spoken word it is the power of utterance qua utterance which just in speaking performs what has to be performed for it is the existence of a pure self qua self in speech the particular self-existent self-consciousness comes as such into existence so that its particular individuality is something for others ego qua this particular pure ego is non-existent otherwise in every mode of expression it is absorbed in some concrete actuality and appears in a shape from which it can withdraw it turns reflectively back into itself away from its act as well as from its physiognomic expression and leaves such an incomplete existence in which there is always at once too much as well as too little lying soulless behind speech however contains this ego in its purity it alone expresses i qua self its existence in this case is qua existence a form of objectivity which has in it the true nature of existence ego is this particular ego but at the same time universal its appearing is ipso facto and at once the alienation and disappearance of this particular ego and in consequence its remaining all the while universal the i that expresses itself is apprehended as an ego it is a kind of infection in virtue of which it establishes at once a unity with those who are aware of it a spark that kindles a universal consciousness of self that it is perceived as a fact by others means eo ipso that its existence is itself dying away this its otherness is taken back into itself and its existence lies just in this that qua self-conscious now as it exists it has no subsistence and that it subsists just through its disappearance this disappearance is therefore itself ipso facto its continuance it is its own cognition of itself and its knowing itself as something that has passed into another self that has been perceived and apprehended and is universal spirit maintains this form of reality here because the extremes too whose unity spirit is have directly the character of being realities each on its own account their unity is disintegrated into rigid aspects each of which is an actual object for the other and each is excluded from the other the unity therefore appears in the role of a mediating term which is excluded and distinguished from the separated reality of the two sides it has therefore itself the actual character of something objective apart and distinguished from its aspects and objective for them that is the unity is an existent objective fact the spiritual substance comes as such into existence only when it has been able to take as its aspect those self-consciousnesses which know this pure self to be a reality claiming immediate validity and therein immediately know too that they are such realities merely through the process of alienation through that pure self the moments of substance get the transparency of a self-knowing category 
and become clarified so far as to be moments of spirit through the mediating process spirit comes to exist in spiritual form spirit in this way is the mediating term presupposing those extremes and produced through their existence but it is also the spiritual whole breaking out between them which sunders itself into them and creates each solely in virtue of that contact with the whole which belongs to its very principle the fact that both extremes are from the start and in their very nature transcended and disintegrated brings out their unity and this is the process which fuses both together interchanges their characteristic features and binds them together and does so in each extreme this mediating process consequently actualizes the principle of each of the two extremes or makes what each is inherently in itself its controlling and moving spirit both extremes the state authority and the noble type of consciousness are disintegrated by this latter in state power the two sides are the abstract universal which is obeyed and the individual will existing on its own account which however does not yet belong to the universal itself in nobility the two sides are the obedience in giving up existence or the inherent maintenance of self-respect and honour and on the other hand a self which exists purely for its own sake and whose self-existence is not yet done away with the self-will that remains always in reserve these two moments into which the extremes are refined and which therefore find expression in language are the abstract universal which is called the universal best and the pure self which by rendering service abrogated the life of absorption in the manifold variety of existence both in principle are the same for pure self is just the abstract universal and hence their unity acts as their mediating term but the self is to begin with actual only in consciousness as one extreme while the inherent nature an sich, is actualized in state authority as the other extreme that state power not merely in the form of honour but in reality should be transferred to it is lacking in the case of consciousness while in the case of state authority there is lacking the fact that it was obeyed not merely as a so-called universal best but as will in other words a state power which is the self regulating and deciding the unity of the principle in which state power still remains and into which consciousness has been refined becomes real in this mediating process and this exists qua mediating term in the simple form of speech all the same the aspects of this unity are not yet present in the form of two selves as selves for state power comes first to be inspired with active selfhood this language is therefore not yet spiritual existence in the sense in which spirit completely knows and expresses itself nobility of consciousness because the extreme form of self assumes the role of creating the language by which the separate factors related are formed into active spiritual wholes the heroism of dumb service passes into the heroism of flattery this reflection of service in express language constitutes the self-conscious self-disintegrating mediating term and reflects back into itself not only its own special extreme but reflects the extreme of universal power back into this self too and makes that power which is at first implicit into an independent self-existence and gives it the individualistic form of self-consciousness through this process the indwelling spirit of this state power comes into existence that of an unlimited monarch it is unlimited the language of flattery raises power into transparent clearly acknowledged universality this moment being the product of language of transparent spiritualized existence is a purified form of self-identity it is a monarch for flattering language likewise puts individualistic self-consciousness on its pinnacle what conscious nobility abandons as regards this aspect of pure spiritual unity is the pure essential nature of its thought its ego itself the naked particularity of its ego which otherwise is only imagined flattery brings out more definitely into relief as an actual existence by giving the monarch a proper name for it is in the name alone that the distinction of the individual from everyone else is not imagined but is actually made by all 
by having a name the individual passes for a pure individual not merely in his own consciousness of himself but in the consciousness of all by its name then the monarch becomes absolutely detached from every one exclusive and solitary and in virtue of it is unique as an atom that cannot commute any part of its essential nature and has nothing like itself this name is thus a reflection into itself or is the actual reality which universal power has inherently within itself through the name the power is the monarch conversely he this particular individual thereby knows himself this individual self to be universal power knows that the nobles not only are ready and prepared for the service of the state authority but are grouped as an ornamental setting round the throne and that they are forever telling him who sits thereon what he is the language of their professed praise is in this way the spirit that unites together the two extremes in the case of state power itself this language reflects in itself the abstract power and gives to it the moment peculiar to the other extreme an isolated self of its own willing and deciding on its own account and consequently gives it self-conscious existence or again by that means this self-conscious particular being comes to be aware of itself for certain as the supreme authority this power is the central focal self into which through relinquishing their own inner certainty of self the many separate centres of selfhood are fused together into one since however this proper spirit of state power subsists by getting its realization and its nourishment from the homage of action and thought rendered by the nobility it is a form of independence in internal self-estrangement the noble the extreme form of self-existence keeps back the other extreme of actual universality and keeps it back for the universality of thought which was relinquished the power of the state has passed over to and fallen upon the noble it falls to the noble primarily to make the state authority truly effective in his existence as a self on his own account that authority ceases to be the inert being it appeared to be qua extreme of abstract and merely implicit reality looked at per se state power reflected back into itself or becoming spiritual means nothing else than that it has come to be a moment of self-conscious life that is is only by being sublated consequently it is now the real in the sense of something whose spiritual meaning lies in being sacrificed and squandered it exists in the sense of wealth it continues no doubt to subsist at the same time as a form of reality over against wealth into which in principle it is forever passing but it is a reality whose inherent principle is this very process of passing over owing to the service and the reverence rendered to it and by which it arises into its opposite into the condition of relinquishing its power thus from its point of view fühl sich the special and peculiar self which constitutes its will becomes by the self-abasement of the nobility a universal that renounces itself becomes completely an isolated particular a mere accident which is the prey of every stronger will what remains to it of the universally acknowledged and incommunicable independence is the empty name while then the nobility may adopt the attitude of something that can in a similar way stand related to the universal power its true nature lies rather in retaining its own separateness of being when rendering its service but in what is properly the abnegation of its personality its true being lies in actually cancelling and rending in pieces the universal substance its spirit is the attitude of thoroughgoing discordance inequality on one side it retains its own will in the honour it receives on the other hand it gives up its will in part it alienates its inner nature from itself and arrives at the extreme of discordance with itself in part it subdues the universal substance to itself and puts this entirely at variance with itself it is obvious that as a result its own specific nature which kept it distinct from the so-called base type of mind disappears and with that this latter type of mind too the base type has gained its end that of subordinating universal power to self-centred isolation of self endowed in this way with universal power self-consciousness exists in the form of universal beneficence 
or from another point of view universal power is wealth that again is itself an object for consciousness for wealth is here taken to be the universal put in subjection which however through this first transcendence is not yet absolutely returned into the self self has not as yet its self as such for object but the universal essential reality in a state of sublation since this object has first come into being the relation of consciousness towards it is immediate and consciousness has thus not yet set forth its want of congruity with this object we have here the nobility preserving its own self-centred existence in the universal that has become non-essential and hence acknowledging the object and feeling grateful to its benefactor wealth has within it from the first the aspect of self-existence für sich sein it is not the selfless universal of state power or the unconstrained simplicity of the natural life of spirit it is state power as holding its own by effort of will in opposition to a will that wants to get the mastery over it and get enjoyment out of it but since wealth has merely the form of being essential this one-sided self-existent life which has no being in itself which is rather the sublation of inherent being is the return of the individual into himself to find no essential reality in his enjoyment it thus itself needs to be given animation and its reflective process of bringing this about consists in its becoming something real in itself as well as for itself instead of being merely for itself wealth which is the sublated essential reality has to become the essentially real in this way it preserves its own spiritual principle in itself it will be sufficient here to describe the content of this process since we have already explained at length its form nobility then stands here in relation not to the object in the general sense of something essential what is alien to it is self-existence itself it finds itself face to face with its own self as such in a state of alienation as an objective solid actuality which it has to take from the hands of another self-centred being another equally fixed and solid entity its object is self-existence that is its own being but by being an object this is at the same time ipso facto an alien reality which is a self-centred being on its own account has a will of its own that is it sees itself under the power of an alien will on which it depends for the concession of itself from each particular aspect self-consciousness can abstract and for that reason even when under an obligation to one of these aspects retains the recognition and inherent validity of self-consciousness as an independent reality here however it finds that as regards its own ego its own proper and peculiar actuality it is outside itself and belongs to an other finds its personality as such dependent on the chance personality of another on the accident of a moment of an arbitrary caprice or some other sort of irrelevant circumstance in the sphere of legal right what lies in the power of the objective being appears as an incidental content from which it is possible to make abstraction and the governing power possessed does not affect the self as such rather this self is recognized but here the self sees its self-certainty as such to be the most unreal thing of all finds its pure personality to be absolutely without the character of personality the sense of its gratitude is therefore a state in which it feels profoundly this condition of being utterly outcast and feels also the deepest revolt as well since the pure ego sees itself outside self and torn in sunder everything that gives continuity and universality everything that bears the name of law good and right is thereby torn to pieces at the same time and goes to wreck and ruin all identity and concord break up for what holds sway is the purest discord and disunion what was absolutely essential is absolutely unessential what has a being on its own account has its being outside itself the pure ego itself is absolutely disintegrated thus since this consciousness receives back from the sphere of wealth the objective form of being a separate self-existence and cancels that objective character it is in principle not only like the preceding reflection not completed but is consciously unsatisfied the reflection since the self receives itself as an objective fact is the immediate contradiction that has taken root in the pure ego as such qua self however it at the same time ipso facto rises above this contradiction it is absolutely elastic 
and again cancels this sublation of itself repudiates this repudiation of itself wherein its self-existence is made to be something alien to it revolts against this acceptance of itself and in the very reception of itself is self-existent since then the attitude of this type of consciousness is bound up with this condition of utter disintegration the distinction constituting its spiritual nature that of being nobility and opposed to baseness falls away and both aspects are the same the spirit of well-doing that characterizes the action of wealth may further be distinguished from that of the conscious life accepting the benefit it confers and deserves special consideration the spirit animating wealth had an unreal insubstantial independence wealth was something to be given up by communicating what it has however it passes into something essential and inherent since it fulfils its nature in sacrificing itself it cancels the aspect of particularity of merely seeking enjoyment for one's own particular self and being thus sublated qua particular the type of spirit here is universality or essentially real what it imparts what it gives to others is self-existence it does not hand itself over however as a natural selfless object as the frankly and freely offered condition of unconscious life but as self-conscious as a reality keeping hold of itself it is not like the power of an inorganic element which is felt by the consciousness receiving its force to be inherently transitory it is the power over self a power aware that it is independent and voluntary and knowing at the same time that what it dispenses becomes the self of someone else wealth thus shares reprobation with its clientele but in place of revolt appears arrogance for in one aspect it knows as well as the self it benefits that its self-existence is a matter of accident but itself is this accident in whose power personality is placed in this mood of arrogance which thinks it has secured through a dull and alien ego nature and thereby brought its inmost being into submission it overlooks the secret rebellion of the other self it overlooks the fact of all bonds being completely cast aside overlooks this pure disintegration in which the self-identity of what exists for its own sake having become sheer internal discordance all oneness and concord all subsistence is rent asunder and in which in consequence the thoughts and intentions of the benefactor are the first to be shattered it stands directly in front of this abyss cleaving it to the innermost this bottomless pit where every solid base and stay have vanished and in the depths it sees nothing but a common thing a display of whims on its part a chance result of its own caprice its spirit consists in quite unreal imagining in being superficially forsaken of all true spiritual import just as self-consciousness had its own manner of speech in dealing with state power in other words just as spirit took the form of expressly and actually mediating between these two extremes self-consciousness has also a mode of speech in dealing with wealth but still more when in revolt does it adopt a language of its own the form of utterance which supplies wealth with the sense of its own essential significance and thereby makes it master of itself is likewise the language of flattery but of ignoble flattery for what it gives out to be the essential reality it knows to be a reality without an inherent nature of its own to be something at the mercy of another the language of flattery however as already remarked is that of a one-sided spirit to be sure its constituent elements are on the one hand a self moulded by service into a shape where it is reduced to bare existence and on the other the inherent reality of the power dominating the self yet the bare principle the pure conception in which the mere self and the inherent reality an sich, that pure ego and this pure reality or thought are one and the same thing this conceptual unity of the two aspects between which the reciprocity takes effect is not consciously felt when this language is used the object is consciously still the inherent reality in opposition to the self in other words the object is not for consciousness at the same time its own proper self as such the language expressing the condition of disintegration wherein spiritual life is rent asunder is however the perfect form of utterance for this entire stage of spiritual culture and development the formative process of moulding self-consciousness building and expresses the spirit in which it most truly exists
this self-consciousness which finds befitting the rebellion that repudiates its own repudiation is eo ipso absolute self-identity in absolute disintegration the pure activity of mediating pure self-consciousness with itself it is the oneness expressed in the identical judgment where one and the same personality is subject as well as predicate but this identical judgment is at the same time the infinite judgment for this personality is absolutely split in two and subject and predicate are entities utterly indifferent one to the other which have nothing to do with each other with no necessary unity so much so that each has the power of an independent personality of its own what exists as a self on its own account has for its object its own self-existence which is object in the sense of an absolute other and yet at the same time directly in the form of itself itself in the sense of an other not as if this had an other content for the content is the same self in the form of an absolute opposite with an existence completely all its own and indifferent we have then here the spirit of this real world of formative culture conscious of its own nature as it truly is and conscious of its ultimate and essential principle the grief this type of spiritual life is the absolute and universal inversion of reality and thought their entire estrangement the one from the other it is pure culture what is found out in this sphere is that neither the concrete realities state power and wealth nor their determinate conceptions good and bad nor the consciousness of good and bad the consciousness that is noble and the consciousness that is base possess real truth it is found that all these moments are inverted and transmuted the one into the other and each is the opposite of itself the universal power which is the substance since it gains a spiritual nature peculiarly its own through the principle of individuality accepts the possession of a self of its own merely as a name by which it is described and even in being actual power is really so powerless as to have to sacrifice itself but this selfless reality given over to another this self that is turned into a thing is in fact the return of the reality into itself it is a self-existence that is there for its own sake the existential form of spirit the principles belonging to these realities the thoughts of good and bad are similarly transmuted and reversed in this process what is characterized as good is bad and vice versa the consciousness of each of these moments by itself the conscious types judged as noble and base these are rather in their real truth similarly the reverse of what these specific forms should be nobility is base and repudiated just as what is repudiated as base turns round into the nobleness that characterizes the most highly developed form of free self-consciousness looked at formally everything is likewise in its external aspects the reverse of what is internally for itself and again it is not really and in truth what it is for itself but something else than it wants to be self-existence on its own account is strictly speaking the loss of self and alienation of self is really self-preservation the state of things brought about here then is that all moments execute justice on one another all round each is just as much in a condition of inherent alienation as it fancies itself in its opposite and in this way reverses its nature spirit truly objective however is just this unity of absolutely separate moments and in fact comes into existence as the common ground the mediating agency just through the independent reality of these selfless extremes its very existence lies in universal talk and depreciatory judgment rending and tearing everything before which all those moments are broken up that are meant to signify something real and to stand for actual members of the whole and which at the same time plays with itself this game of self-dissolution this judging and talking is therefore the real truth which cannot be got over while it overpowers everything it is that which in this real world is alone truly of importance each part of this world comes to find there its spirit expressed or gets to be spoken of with spirit and finds said of it what it is the honest soul takes each moment as a permanent and essential fact and is an uncultivated unreflective condition which does not think and does not know that it is just doing the very inverse the distraught and disintegrated soul is however aware of inversion it is in fact a condition of absolute inversion the conceptual principle predominates there 
brings together into a single unity the thoughts that lie far apart in the case of the honest soul and the language clothing its meaning is therefore full of esprit and wit geistreich the content uttered by spirit and uttered about itself is then the inversion and perversion of all conceptions and realities a universal deception of itself and of others the shamelessness manifested in stating this deceit is just on that account the greatest truth this style of speech is the madness of the musician who piled and mixed up together some thirty airs italian french tragic comic of all sorts of kinds now in a deep undertone he descended to the depths of hell then contracting his throat to a high piping falsetto he rent the vault of the skies raving and soothing haughtily imperious and mockingly jeering by turns the placid soul that in simple honesty of heart takes the music of the good and true to consist in harmony of sound and uniformity of tone that is in a melodious chord regards this style of expression as a fickle fantasy of wisdom and folly a melee of so much skill and low cunning composed of ideas as likely to be right as wrong with as complete a perversion of sentiment with as much consummate shamefulness in it as absolute frankness candour and truth it is not able to refrain from bringing out the sound of every note and running up and down the whole gamut of feeling from the depths of contempt and repudiation to the highest pitch of admiration and stirring emotion a vein of the ridiculous will be diffused through the latter which takes away from their nature the former will find in their very candour a strain of atoning reconcilement will find in their shuddering depths the all-powerful qualities which give spirit a self if we consider by way of contrast to the mode of utterance indulged in by this self-transparent distracted type of mind the language adopted by that simple placid consciousness of the good and the true we find that it can only speak in monosyllables when face to face with the frank and self-conscious eloquence of the mind developed under the influence of culture for it can say nothing to the latter that the latter does not know and say if it gets beyond speaking in monosyllables then it says the same thing that the cultivated mind expresses but in doing so commits in addition the folly of imagining that it is saying something new something different its very syllables disgraceful base are this folly already for the other says them of itself this latter type of mind perverts in its mode of utterance everything that sounds the same because this self-sameness is merely an abstraction but in its actual reality is intrinsically and inherently perversion on the other hand again the unsophisticated mind takes under its protection the good and the noble that is what retains its identity of meaning in being objectively expressed and takes care of it in the only way here possible that is to say the good must not lose its value because it may be linked with what is bad or mingled with it for to be thus associated with badness is its condition and necessity and the wisdom of nature lies in this fact yet this unsophisticated mind while it intended to contradict has merely in doing so gathered into a trifling form the meaning of what spirit said and put it in a manner which by turning the opposite of noble and good into the necessary condition of noble and good means in an unthinking way to state something else than that the so-called noble and good is by its very nature the reverse of itself or that what bad is conversely something excellent if the naive consciousness makes up for this barren soulless idea by the concrete reality of what is excellent when it produces an example of what is excellent whether in the form of a fictitious case or a true story and thus shows it to be not an empty name but an actual fact then the universal reality of perverted action stands in sharp contrast to the entire real world where that example constitutes merely something quite isolated and particular merely an espèce a sort of thing and to represent the existence of the good and the noble as an isolated particular anecdote whether fictitious or true is the bitterest thing that can be said about it finally should the naive mind require this entire sphere of perversion to be dissolved and broken up it cannot ask the individual to withdraw out of it for even diogenes in his tub with his pretence of withdrawal is under the sway of that perversion 
and to ask this of the particular individual is to ask him to do precisely what is taken to be bad that is to care for the self as particular but if the demand to withdraw is directed at the universal individual it cannot mean that reason must again give up the culture and development of spiritual conscious life which has been reached that reason should let the extensive riches of its moments sink back into the naivete of natural emotion and revert and approximate to the wild condition of the animal consciousness which is also called the natural state of innocence on the contrary the demand for this dissolution when addressed to the spirit realized in culture can only mean that it must qua spirit return out of its confusion into itself and win for itself a still higher level of conscious life in point of fact however spirit has already accomplished this result to be conscious of its own distraught and torn condition and to express itself accordingly this is to pour scornful laughter on its existence on the confusion pervading the whole and on itself as well it is at the same time this whole confusion dying away and yet apprehending itself to be doing so this self-apprehending vanity of all reality and of every definite principle reflects the real world into itself in a twofold form in the particular self of consciousness qua particular and in the pure universality of consciousness in thought according to the one aspect mind thus come to itself has directed its gaze into the world of actual reality and makes that reality its own purpose and its immediate content from the other side its gaze is in part turned solely on itself and against that world of reality in part turned away from it towards heaven and its object is the region beyond the world in respect of that return into self the vanity of all things is its own peculiar vanity it is itself vain it is self existing for its own sake a self that knows not only how to sum up and chatter about everything but with esprit and wit to hit off the contradiction that lies in the heart of the all so solid seeming reality and the fixed determinations which judgment set up and that contradiction is their real truth looked at formally it finds everything estranged from itself self-existence is cut off from essential being an sich. what is intended and the purpose are separated from real truth and from both again existence for another what is ostensibly put forward is cut off from the proper meaning the real fact the true intention it thus knows exactly how to put each moment in antithesis to every other knows in short how to express correctly the perversion that dominates all of them it knows better than each what each is no matter how it is constituted since it apprehends what is substantial from the side of that disunion and contradiction of elements combined within its nature but not from the side of disunion itself it understands very well how to pass judgment on this substantial reality but has lost the capacity of truly grasping it this vanity needs at the same time the vanity of all things in order to get from them consciousness of itself it therefore itself creates this vanity and is the soul that supports it state power and wealth are the supreme purposes of its strenuous exertion it is aware that through renunciation and sacrifice it is moulded into universal shape that it attains universality and in possessing universality finds general recognition and acceptance state power and wealth are the real and actually acknowledged sources of power but its gaining acceptance thus is itself vain and just by the fact that it gets the mastery over them it knows them to be not real by themselves knows rather itself to be the power within them and them to be vain and empty that in possessing them it thus itself is able to stand apart from and outside them this is what it expresses in spirited languages and to express this is therefore its supreme interest and the true meaning of the whole process in such utterance this self in the form of a pure self not associated with or bound by determinations derived either from reality or thought comes consciously to be a spiritual entity having a truly universal significance and value it is the condition in which the nature of all relationships is rent asunder and it is the conscious rending of them all but only by self-consciousness being roused to revolt does it know its own peculiar torn and shattered condition 
and in its knowing this it has ipso facto risen above that condition in that state of self-conscious vanity all substantial content comes to have a negative significance which can no longer be taken in a positive sense the positive object is merely the pure ego itself and the consciousness that is rent in sunder is inherently and essentially this pure self-identity of self-consciousness returned to itself End of section eight. Section nine of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume Two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter six B, Part One B, Belief and Pure Insight the spiritual condition of self-alienation exists in the sphere of culture as a fact but since this whole has become estranged from itself there lies beyond this sphere the non-actual region of pure consciousness of thought its content consists of what has been reduced purely to thought its absolute element is thinking since however thinking is in the first instance the element of this sphere consciousness has merely these thoughts but it does not yet think them or does not know that they are thoughts to consciousness they appear in the form of presentations they are objects in the form of ideas for it comes out of the sphere of actuality into that of pure consciousness but is itself still to all intents and purposes in the sphere of actuality with the determinateness that implies the conscious state of being rent and torn to pieces is still essentially and inherently the self-identity of pure consciousness not as a fact that itself is aware of but only as presented to us who are considering its condition it has thus not as yet completed within itself the process of rising above this condition it is simply there and it still has within itself the opposite principle by which it is conditioned without as yet having become master of that principle through a mediating process hence the essential content of its thought is not taken to be an essential object merely in the form of abstract immanence an sich, but in the form of a common object an object that has merely been elevated into another element without having lost the character of an object that is not constituted by thought it is essentially distinct from the immanent nature which constitutes the essential being of the stoic type of consciousness the significant factor for stoicism was merely the form of thought as such which has any content foreign to it that is drawn from reality in the case of the consciousness just described however the form of thought is not the significant element similarly it is essentially distinct from the inherent principle of the virtuous type of conscious life here the essential fact stands no doubt in a relation to reality it is the essence of reality itself but it is no more than an unrealized essence of it in the above type of consciousness the essence although no doubt beyond reality stands all the same for an actual real essence in the same way the inherently right and good which reason as lawgiver establishes and the universal operating when consciousness tests and examines laws neither of these has the character of actual reality hence while pure thought fell within the sphere of spiritual culture as an aspect of the estrangement characteristic of this sphere as the standard in fact for judging abstract good and abstract bad it has become enriched by having gone through the process of the whole with the element of reality and thereby with content this reality of its essential being however is at the same time merely a reality of pure consciousness not of concrete actual consciousness it is no doubt lifted into the element of thought but this concrete consciousness does not yet take for it a thought it is beyond the reality peculiar to this consciousness for it means flight from the latter in the form in which religion here appears for it is religion obviously that we are speaking about as the belief which belongs to the realm of culture religion does not yet appear as it is truly and completely an und für sich it has already come before us in other phases that is as the unhappy consciousness as a form of conscious process with no substantial content in it so too in the case of the ethical substance it appeared as a belief in the nether world but the consciousness of departed spirits is strictly speaking not belief not the inner essence subsisting in the element of pure consciousness away beyond the actual 
there the belief has itself an immediate existence in the present its element its substance is the family but at the stage we are now considering religion is in part the outcome of the substance and is the pure consciousness of that substance in part this pure consciousness is alienated from its concrete actual consciousness the essence from its existence it is thus doubtless no longer the insubstantial process of consciousness but it has still the characteristic of opposition to reality qua the given reality in general and of opposition to the reality of self-consciousness in particular it is essentially thereof merely a belief this pure consciousness of absolute being is a consciousness in alienation let us see more closely what is the characteristic of that whose other it is we can only consider it in connection with this other in the first instance this pure consciousness seems to have over against it merely the world of actuality but since its nature is to flee from this actuality and thereby is characterized by opposition it has this actuality inherent within its own being pure consciousness is therefore essentially in its very being self-alienated and belief constitutes merely one side of it the other side has already arisen too for pure consciousness is reflection out of the world of culture in such a way that the substantial content of this sphere as also the separate fragments into which it falls are shown to be what they inherently are essential modes of spiritual life absolutely restless processes or determinate moments which are at once cancelled in their opposite their essential nature bare consciousness is thus the bare simplicity of absolute distinction distinction which as it stands is no distinction consequently it is pure self-existence not of a particular self but essentially universal self whose being consists in a restless process invading and pervading the stable existence of actual fact in it is found the certainty that knows itself at once to be the truth there we have pure thought in the sense of absolute notion with all its power of negativity which annihilates every objective existence that would claim to stand over against consciousness and turns it into a form of conscious existence this pure consciousness is at the same time simple and undifferentiated as well just because its distinction is no distinction being this form of bare and simple reflection into self however it is the element of belief in which spirit has the special feature of positive universality of what is inherent and essential in contrast with that self-existence on the part of self-consciousness forced back upon itself away from this unsubstantial world whose being is mere dissolution spirit in its undivided unity is when we consider its true meaning at once the absolute movement the ceaseless process of negating its appearance as well as the essential substance thereof satisfied within itself and the positive stability of that appearance but bearing as they inherently do the characteristic of alienation both these moments fall apart in the shape of a twofold consciousness the former is pure insight the spiritual process concentrated and focused in self-consciousness a process which has over against it the consciousness of something positive the form of objectivity or presentation and which directs itself upon this presented object the proper and peculiar object of this insight is however merely pure ego the bare consciousness of the positive element of unbroken self-identity finds its object on the other hand in the inner reality as such pure insight has therefore in the first instance no content within it because it exists for itself by negating everything in it to belief on the other hand belongs the content but without insight while the former does not get away from self-consciousness the latter to be sure has its content as well in the element of pure self-consciousness but only in presentation not in conceptions in pure consciousness not in pure self-consciousness belief is as a fact in this way pure consciousness of the essential reality that is of the bare and simple inner nature and is thus thought the primary factor in the nature of belief which is generally overlooked the immediateness which characterizes the presence of the essential reality within it is due to the fact that its object is essence inner nature that is pure thought this immediateness however so far as thinking enters consciousness or pure consciousness enters into self-consciousness maintains the significance of an objective being that lies beyond consciousness of self 
it is because of the significance which immediacy and simplicity of pure thought thus retain in consciousness that the essential reality in the case of belief drops into being an objectively presented idea vorstellung instead of being the content of thought and comes to be looked at as a supersensible world which is essentially an other for self-consciousness in the case of pure insight on the other hand the entrance of pure thought into consciousness has the opposite character objectivity has the significance of a content that is merely negative that cancels itself and returns into the self that is to say only the self is properly object to self or to put it otherwise the object only has truth so far as it has the form of self as belief and pure insight fall in common with pure consciousness they also in common involve the mind's return out of the concrete sphere of spiritual culture there are three aspects therefore from which they show what they are in one aspect each is outside every relation and has a being all its own in another each takes up an attitude towards the concrete actual world standing in antithesis to pure consciousness while in the third form each is related to the other inside pure consciousness in the case of belief the aspect of complete being of being in and for itself is its absolute object whose content and character we have already come to know for it lies in the very notion of belief that this object is nothing else than the real world lifted into the universality of pure consciousness the articulation of this world therefore constitutes the organization belonging to pure universality also except that the parts in the latter case do not alienate one another when spiritualized but are complete realities all by themselves are spirits returned into themselves and self-contained the process of their transition from one into the other is therefore only for us who are analyzing the process an alienation of the characteristic nature in which their distinction lies and only for us the observers does it constitute a necessary series for belief however their distinction is a static diversity and their movement simply a historical fact to deal shortly with the external character of their form as in the world of culture state power or the good was primary so here the first and foremost moment is absolute being spirit absolutely self-contained so far as it is simple eternal substance but in the process of realizing its constitutive notion which consists in being spirit that substance passes over into a form where it exists for an other its self-identity becomes actual absolute being actualized in self-sacrifice it becomes a self but a self that is transitory and passes away hence the third stage is the return of self thus alienated the substance thus abased into its first primal simplicity of nature only when this is done is spirit presented and manifested as spirit these distinct ultimate realities when brought back by thought into self out of the flux of the actual world are changeless eternal spirit whose being lies in thinking the unity which they constitute while thus torn away from self-consciousness these realities all the same lay hold on it for if the ultimate reality were to be fixed and unmoved in the form of the first bare and simple substance it would remain alien to self-consciousness but the laying aside the emptying of this substance and afterwards its spirit involves the element of concrete actuality and thereby participates in the believing self-consciousness or the believing attitude of consciousness belongs to the real world according to this second condition the believing type of consciousness partly finds its actuality in the real world of culture and constitutes its spirit and its existence which have been described partly however belief takes up an attitude of opposition to this its own actuality looks on this as something vain and is the process of cancelling and abolishing it this process does not consist in the believing consciousness having ingenious views about the perverted condition of that reality for it is bare and simple consciousness which reckons esprit and wit as something vain and empty because this still has the real world for its purpose on the contrary in opposition to its placid realm of thought stands concrete actuality as a soulless form of existence which on that account has to be overcome in external fashion this obedience through service and rewards by cancelling sense knowledge and action 
brings out the consciousness of unity with the self-complete and self-existing being though not in the sense of an actual perceived unity this service is merely the incessant process of producing the sense of unity a process that never completely reaches its goal in the actual present the religious communion no doubt does so for it is universal self-consciousness but for the individual self-consciousness the realm of pure thought necessarily remains something away beyond its sphere of reality or again since this remote region by the emptying the kenosis of the eternal being has entered the sphere of actuality its actuality is sensuous non-conceptual but one sensuous actuality is ever indifferent and external to another and what lies beyond has thus only received the further character of remoteness in space and time the essential notion however the concrete actuality of spirit directly present to itself remains for belief an inner principle which is all and affects all but never itself comes to the light in the case of pure insight however the principle the essential notion begriff is alone the real and this third aspect of belief that of being an object for pure insight is the specific relation in which the notion here appears pure insight itself has similarly to be considered partly by itself an und für sich, partly in relation to the real world so far as the real world is still present in positive shape that is in the form of a sense of vanity and lastly in that relation to belief already mentioned we have already seen what pure insight by itself is belief is unperturbed pure consciousness of spirit as the ultimate reality pure insight is the self-consciousness of spirit as the ultimately real it knows the essentially real therefore not qua essence but qua absolute self its aim thus is to cancel every other kind of independence which falls without self-consciousness whether that be the independence of the actually objective or of the inherently real and to mould it into conceptual form it is not merely the certainty of self-conscious reason assured of being all truth it knows that it is so in the form however in which the notion of pure insight meets us first it is not yet realized as a phase of consciousness it appears in consequence as something contingent as something isolated and particular and its inmost constitutive nature appears as some purpose that it has to carry out and realize it has to begin with the intention of making pure insight universal that is of making everything that is actual into a notion and the notion for every self-consciousness the intention is pure for its content is pure insight and this insight is similarly pure for its content is merely the absolute notion which finds no opposition in an object and is not restricted in itself in the unrestricted notion there are found at once both the aspects that everything objective is to signify the self-existent self-consciousness and that this is to signify something universal that pure insight is to be the property of all self-consciousnesses this second feature of the intention is so far a result of culture in that in culture the distinctions of objective spirit the parts and express determinations of its world have come to naught as well as the distinctions which appeared as originally determinate natures genius talent special capacities in general belong to the world of actuality in so far as this world contains still the aspect of being a herd of self-conscious individuals where in confusion and mutual violence individuals cheat and struggle with one another over the contents of the real world the above distinctions doubtless have no place in it as genuine as species. individuality neither is contented with unreal fact nor has special content in purposes of its own it signifies merely something universally acknowledged and accepted that is cultivated and developed and the question of distinction is reduced to a matter of less or more energy a distinction of quantity that is a non-essential distinction this last difference however has come to nothing by the fact that the distinction in the state where consciousness was completely torn asunder turned round into an absolute qualitative distinction what is there the other for the ego is merely the ego itself in this infinite judgment all the one-sidedness and peculiarity of the original self-existing self is extinguished 
the self knows itself qua pure self to be its own object and this absolute identity of both sides is the element of pure insight pure insight therefore is the simple ultimate being undifferentiated within itself and at the same time the universal achievement and production and the universal possession of all in this simple spiritual substance self-consciousness gives itself and maintains for itself in every object the sense of this its own particularity or of action just as conversely the individuality of self-consciousness is there identical with itself and universal this pure insight is then the spirit that calls to every consciousness be for yourself what you are essentially in yourself rational End of section 9